Welcome to the first lecture of the Summer Applied Clinical Microbiology course. This lecture we're going to discuss the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory as well as quality control. So in the clinical micro laboratory, we have to consider the total laboratory testing process. And in that testing process, there are many different components. These components include the patient, the physician orders, the specimen collection, the specimen transport to the laboratory, the laboratory analyses including quality control, the data flow and the physician interpretation, as well as the treatment and diagnosis. So since there's many different components in the clinical micro laboratory, we as laboratory technologists must ensure that results are accurate, are significant, and are clinically relevant. Considering there's so many components in the clinical laboratory setting, we have to start to discuss specimen management. So in order to ensure that our laboratory tests are accurate, relevant, and clinically significant, the correct anatomic site must be selected in order to obtain the appropriate specimen. The specimen collection must be performed using proper techniques as well as the appropriate supplies that are made for that specimen. The specimen must be packaged in a container that's designed to promote the survival of the possible causative organism as well as to eliminate any leakage. And the specimen must be delivered to the laboratory as soon as possible. The common types of specimens we'll see in a clinical microbiology laboratory include urine, blood, eye specimens, not as common, but you can get them, ear specimens, nasal specimens, skin, wound, tissue, genital, fecal, any type of body fluid, such as a spinal fluid, sputum, throat swabs, and also there are various other types of specimens that you would occasionally get in the clinical micro lab. So in specimens, one of the common errors is miscollected or mislabeled specimens. So for a wound specimen, the anatomic site must be provided. So in other words, when you get that specimen in the laboratory, it should say exactly where that specimen was obtained. For example, the left forearm. The specimen of choice for a wound is the advancing margin of, uh, margin of the wound. So you wouldn't want to just swab around the wound because you're just going to get skin flora. So you don't want a superficial sample from the top of the lesion. You want to really get into that wound to try to figure out what organism might be involved in an infection. For an ear specimen, this is usually a specimen you would get from someone who has otitis media. So for ear specimens, swabs are not the specimen of choice. The best specimen is to obtain fluid through a tympanocentesis, where fluid is actually drawn into a sterile container from deep into the middle air region, and not necessarily a swab just stuck kind of into the air where you're only going to get skin flora and usually you wouldn't actually get the organism that might be causing an infection. For a 
a sputum specimen, a sputum is a very tricky specimen and it may not be the specimen of choice for diagnosing a bacterial pneumonia, but you will get many sputum specimens for pneumonia and especially in the mycobacteriology section of the clinical laboratory. So you have to remember that sputum samples, since they're coughed up from deep into the lungs through the mouth, they are contaminated with your normal oropharyngeal flora. So just because you have bacteria in a sputum specimen, it doesn't mean that that bacteria that you're seeing is causing an infection. So you really have to analyze that sputum appropriately. Specimen transport is very critical in the clinical micro laboratory. So as we all know, microbes are living things. They multiply, bacteria multiply through binary fission, and they can die very rapidly, especially some of our more fastidious organisms that have very strict growth requirements. They're not going to live very long outside of the body. So you have to really consider transport and transporting appropriately so that you don't kill any of your possible organisms that might be involved in an infection. You also have to consider that organisms may be multiplying during transport to the laboratory. So in a specimen where the number of organisms is important, you wouldn't want that organism to multiply such that you would think there's a massive infection when in fact originally there were only one or two organisms. So if the specimen were able to allow the organisms to multiply or your causative agent in that specimen were to die, then that specimen no longer represents the disease process from the patient where the specimen was taken. We reject many specimens in the clinical laboratory, regardless of which area you're in, whether it's chemistry or microbiology or hematology, there are numerous reasons why specimens are rejected. So one of the common reasons is that there is no label on the specimen or the label was not done properly. So it doesn't have the appropriate information on it or the information on the label doesn't actually match what's on the order sheet. Another reason for rejecting, rejection is using an inappropriate container. So for example, maybe a container that's not sterile. If the specimen comes in, in to the laboratory and it's been leaking out of the container, that specimen may usually be rejected because then that means that the, the specimen is no longer in a sterile um, container. There's been a leak. Environmental bacteria could have gotten into that container and many times when there's a leak, you no longer have enough specimen left in the container, which leads us to our next reason for rejection is what's called QNS. QNS stands for quantity not sufficient. So for certain types of procedures in the clinical lab, you need a specific quantity of specimen. And if you don't have it, you can't perform the test. Another thing is prolonged transport. You always have to look at the time of collection and the time that it is delivered to the laboratory. For certain specimens, that transport time is critical, and if the specimen doesn't get to the lab in the right time period, you can't test that specimen. Another reason for rejection is that you get duplicate specimens submitted at the exact same time. So there could be many reasons for that. Maybe there were two specimens obtained from that patient, one in the morning, one later at night, and you should have tested them um, one earlier than the other and they're delivered at the same time. Or it could be an indication that an improper label was put onto one of the tubes. So these are the common reasons for specimen rejection, but keep in mind,
there are rules in every laboratory you go into. So when you get into your specific laboratory for your rotation, and then once you go into a lab, whether it's the same lab or a completely different lab for your job, you always have to consider the rules in that laboratory because they may be different just because there are certain rules to follow for rejection in the laboratory that you do your clinical rotation, it doesn't mean that those same rules are going to be at the job, the job that you get if it's not the same um, laboratory. So always follow the rules that are specific for the laboratory that you're working in. The workflow of clinical specimens in the laboratory, usually you receive the specimen. The specimen gets set up. So usually in microbiology, that means once the spe specimen is accepted, it's in the right container, it was brought to the laboratory at the appropriate time, then the specimen is inoculated onto the appropriate plates. And once again, which plates you set your specimen up on may vary from laboratory to laboratory. So you also have, you have to follow the setup protocols for the lab you're working in. You then are going to incubate your culture. Those are incubated overnight, which usually is approximately 18 to 24 hours. Remember that there are some specimens, such as your anaerobic specimen, where you would incubate for longer than that time period. So anaerobes would be 48 hours. Or your mycobacterium, which may be you have to incubate for weeks. Once your culture is incubated for the appropriate period of time, the culture must be read. So you're going to read out cultures depending on what the, the specimen type is. Once you read out your cultures, you look at them, look at each plate, determine if there's normal flora on the plate or if there might be a potential pathogen. If there is a potential pathogen, you need to set up your identification as well as your antimicrobial sensitivity tests. You then obtain the results, whether this is done via um, instruments, computer-based, or manually. Let's say the um, instrument breaks down. You may have to set up te manual tests. The results are usually going to be entered, sometimes written up manually. Usually they're going to be entered into a computer system. And once again, depending on what lab you work in, there may be a completely different computer system from laboratory to laboratory. So you you always are going to have to learn whatever system that laboratory is using. And then those um, results are reported to the physician. So when you receive a specimen in the clinical laboratory, the specimen must always be matched with the order sheet or the requisition sheet. Everything has to match the patient name, the identification number. So you don't move on with that specimen. You don't do anything with that specimen unless the rec sheet and the label on the specimen match. You have to also check for the appropriateness of the test request. So for example, uh, urine comes in and a request for an anaerobe um, is, is requested. That wouldn't be an appropriate specimen for an anaerobic test. So you always have to look at that. Each specimen is assigned unique assess accession numbers and the laboratory puts their own label onto the specimen. Usually this is done through a computer system. Also, all media that's going to be inoculated with that specimen has to be labeled appropriately. All specimen setup in the clinical microbiology laboratory is done under the biological safety hood. These are 
BSL-2 biological safety level 2 cabinets that have HEPA filters that are constantly filtering the air inside of the hood and no air ever escapes. So everything stays in the hood and goes through a filter. So the person setting up that specimen isn't exposed to possibly dangerous pathogens. Under that hood, that's when the specimen is going to be opened up and the media is going to be um, inoculated. So usually here's where all your plates are going to be inoculated with each specimen. And you guys already know the common types of media where specimens will be inoculated onto. So we have our sheep blood agar, our chocolate agar, McConkey agar, our modified Thayer Martin agar, your CDC anaerobic agars, and there are some broths that, that might be used such as thioglycolate or BHI which is brain heart infusion broth. You always have to consider the atmosphere for the specimen. So we have to incubate our specimen in the appropriate incubator. So some specimens are going to go in the CO2 incubator, especially our specimens that might have a Haemophilus or a Neisseria or a Streptococcus, which need CO2 to grow. Some specimens are going to go into the ambient air incubator. All of our anaerobic specimens have to go into our anaerobic atmosphere. Usually, most of our cultures are going to be incubated at 35 to 37 degrees, and most of them go overnight for 18 to 24 hours. But there's always those exceptions that always have to be con um, considered. After your overnight incubation, you have to remove the plates from the incubator. You're usually going to organize your plates, whether it's numerically or alphabetically, and that's going to depend from lab to lab, and it also may depend from person to person within a laboratory. You also have to decide which organisms to work up and which ones are just normal flora. So in the spring semester, we learned about each different type of organism. So we started with the gram-positive cocci, and then the gram-positive rods, and then the gram-negative cocci. So we just talked about all the various organisms or bugs. Well, for in the summer, we're going to talk about systems specimens, body systems, and all the various types of organisms that you would look for in that specific specimen. So we're no longer going to think just gram-positive cocci and just gram-negative rods. We have to think what is going to be in that specimen, which organisms are we going to see as normal flora, and what are the organisms that are common causes of infection in that specimen? What do those look like? What do we have to be trying to figure out here? So it actually gets a little tricky when you're looking at these clinical plates and they have tons of different organism on it, you'd think, oh boy, this person has a serious, serious problem. There's just tons of organism on this plate. Well, no, all that organism might be normal flora. So there's many plates that you're just going to look at quickly, close it, and put down normal flora present. And that's it. Move on to the next plate. So that takes some time to really look at a plate and be able to decide among many, many different organisms which ones might be the pathogen and which is normal flora. You're going to, of course, work up that specimen appropriately. If there is a pathogen, you want to do your ID and your sensitivity, and everything then has to go into the computer system.
So a big no-no. These are things you never want to do in the clinical lab. And the biggest no-no is sniffing a plate. And if you are in clinical microbiology, you may see people that have been working in the clinical micro lab for 30 years, 40 years, and some of the first things they'll do is open up that plate and give it a big whiff. Yes, there are bacteria that have particular smells. And many times those organisms that have smells, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, has that sweet, grape-like, fruity smell. The second you open that plate just to look at it, you can recognize the distinct macroscopic morphology of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and you will pick up that sweet smell without taking a big whiff of the plate. So no one should ever be sniffing a plate. There have been numerous cases of fatalities of laboratory workers who sniffed plates and that plate happened to have a highly aerosol pathogen on it. So you never want to sniff a plate. You do have to keep in mind those odors, the distinct odors that certain organisms have. And like I said, without taking a big whiff, you will pick up some of these odors just wafting out of the plate. You don't have to, you know, sniff it. So just keep in mind Haemophilus has a musty or what's called a mousy smell. Iconella has a bleach smell and Pseudomonas aeruginosa has that grape fruity smell. But don't ever whiff or sniff a plate. Even if you see all of the older techs in the clinical micro setting sniffing plates, they truly shouldn't be sniffing plates. And if there were ever to be an inspection and anyone were to see someone sniffing plates, that would not go over well. So of course, once you figure out what your pathogens might be, you're going to set up all of your identification and sensitivity tests. So usually in a clinical lab, you're not going to do as much tubed media test as you did in the spring semester and as you will do in the summer laboratory. So for manual identification, you may occasionally set up some tubed media, maybe a thioglycolate broth, the, the manual uh, test that is commonly done in the clinical setting is the API for your gram-negative rods and also the rapid test system, which is a little cartridge that has these little wells. And it's very easy to inoculate and you usually get your results in three to four hours. So those are some of the manual tests that you would do. Most of the identification and sensitivity is going to be done via the Vitec or the Microscan. Those are the two most common instruments that clinical lab micro laboratories have. There, you may work in a smaller laboratory that has a different type of instrumentation. You may work in a lab that doesn't um, use an instrument. So you always have to keep in mind what the laboratory is using and learn their system. For manual sensitivity testing, Kirby Bowers aren't usually done. However, if the instrumentation is not working, you may have to set up Kirby Bowers. You will drop discs on plates though. So you will do that disc dropping. You will drop an Optichin or Bacitracin disc onto your blood agar plates for your straps. And many laboratories will do e-test strips. Once you get your results, as we said, most laboratories have computer-based systems now where you go in and you enter the identification number and the uh, sheet opens up and it just has all the tests and you type in your results. There may be something you need to type which means positive or which means negative. Some laboratories still have manual report forms that you would need to fill out. 
but most will use that computer and a manual report usually is going to be done when the computer is not working. And you will see once you are in the clinical laboratory, there are numerous times when the computer is down, when one or many instruments are down, and you're not only trying to fix one of the instruments, but then you also have to set up your tests manually until, so that you have some results because you just don't know sometimes when that instrument is going to be repaired. Many times you'll try for a while to fix it. A lot of times you will fix it, but many times the instrument tech folks have to be called in. They might not be able to come in that day. So you'll see that they're, the, you know, the clinical laboratory is not perfect and things will break down. How do we report things to physicians? Well, with HIPAA and all of the different rules, reporting to physicians, um, there's spe very specific rules that must be followed. So some situations you could use the mail. Many um, laboratories will use a courier system. In a big, large hospital, there may be a tube system that goes through the hospital. Fax, although you have to be careful with fax because you just don't know who's on the other end. So the fax has to have a cover sheet. There's rules that need to be followed, as well as the internet and web-based reports. But again, because of HIPAA, regardless of the method that you use to send a report, you have to follow the rules stringently so that some person doesn't get a result when they shouldn't have. Handling of specimens. So we'll start off with urines. Urines should be transported to the lab within 30 minutes. However, that's usually not the case. So many times specimens are collected throughout the day and then at the end of the day a courier may come and deliver all the specimens to the laboratory, especially if you're working in a private laboratory. In a hospital setting, possibly you might actually get urines to the lab in 30 minutes and you can just analyze them directly. But many times they don't get there in 30 minutes, so if they're not going to be analyzed within 30 minutes of collection, they must be refrigerated. Urine should never be frozen and they should never sit out at room temperature for longer than 30 minutes. When you're inoculating a urine specimen, you have to use a calibrated loop to streak your plates. And usually the 1 to 1,000 calibrated loop will be used for your typical clean catch urine specimen. Urines are commonly inoculated onto both sheep blood agar and McConkie agar. For a blood specimen, your blood cultures must be inoculated into two different bottles. One of the bottles is the aerobic bottle and the other is anaerobic. Usually your blood specimens are going to be collected two to three sets in a 24 hour period. So maybe someone will get their blood drawn for a blood culture early in the morning. They might get another blood culture draw in the afternoon and possibly even another in the evening. So you, you're usually going to do blood cultures several sets, at least two, in a 24-hour period. Bottles have to be incubated in their appropriate culture bottles and incubator for five days before you can say that that blood culture is negative. As soon as the machine, we have our blood culture instrument that can actually detect if there's organism growing in the bottle and they'll flag that bottle. They'll, a light will go off or an alarm will go off depending on the system. <laughs> 
once that bottle is flagged as being positive, immediately that bottle has to be pulled, that culture has to be stained, and you have to see what's in there. And before you even culture and do tests on that organism, you're going to call the physician and say, one of the bottles of this patient just was flagged positive and we just observed gram positive coccyan clusters and then you would sub that bottle onto your appropriate plates and incubate them overnight and do your typical ID and sensitivity on them but immediately any positive bottle is stained and reported to the physician. For body fluids, this could be spinal fluid, peritoneal, pleural, pericardial, and joint fluid. If the volume is sufficient, and many times with these body fluids, the volume is very minute. So a lot of times these specimens will get rejected for, because they're QNS or quantity not sufficient. But if the quantity is sufficient, and it's not too mucoid or mucousy, you need to centrifuge your body fluids because there may only be a few organisms in there and you want to make sure you find an organism in a body fluid. These body fluids should be sterile. These are sterile sites. So any bacteria in these sites is important and could indicate a fatal infection. So you want to centrifuge, you want to take off the supernatant. The supernatant has to be placed into a separate sterile tube. You're then going to take the sediment from that spun down fluid and you're going to sub it onto the appropriate plates. Body fluids are usually incubated both aerobically and anaerobically because you really don't know what's causing the infection. So these specimens are considered panic results. So our panic results would be a positive blood culture, and we already said you would immediately take a portion of that blood culture bottle out, stain it, and call the stain results to the physician. Also, you'd sub and ID and sen induce sensitivities on the blood culture. But any positive blood culture has to be reported immediately. A positive um, spinal fluid, gram stain, again, if you gram stain a direct fluid and there's organism, you'd call that in. Any positive fluid culture, any positive acid fast bacillus smear or sputum smear that you find acid fast bacilli, any positive mycobacterium tuberculosis cultures, any vancomycin resistant enterococcus or any vancomycin resistant staphylococcus. There's also many tests in the clinical microbiology lab that are done that are not culture tests. So we don't sub these onto plates and then do our different tests on them. These are usually going to be more rapid based um, screening tests. So you could do your rapid strep screens. You can do strep typing, group typing. You can do toxin detection for, let's say, Clostridium difficile. Some micro labs do occult bloods where you're looking for blood in a stool specimen. Sometimes that's not done in microbiology. For example, I worked in hematology and we did the occult bloods in the hematology lab. So it's going to vary. Serology sometimes is done in a microbiology laboratory. Again, I worked in a clinical laboratory and um, I, I worked in hematology and we did all the serology. So that's going to vary from clinical setting to clinical setting. Some other non-culture tests, a cryptococcus antigen test, there could be rapid influenza testing, many of the viral testing are going to be serological based, there's some agglutination types of tests like your tests for mononucleosis, 
Um, you might do sed rates. Sometimes those are done in hematology. It depends. So there, there are some non-culture testing that you will do in the microbiology laboratory. So for your direct gram stains, and you're going to see this chart later when we're talking about the various specimens. You want to quantify the number of cells and the organism per oil immersion field. So quantification, if there's you know many organisms for a wound and an aspirate, that would be greater than 25 and for a sterile body fluid that would be greater than 10. In a sterile body fluid if you have 2 to 10 cells or organisms per oil immersion field that would be called moderate. For a wound or an aspirate it would be 5 to 25. If you have 0 to 2 for a body fluid or 0 to 5 for wounds and aspirate, that would be considered few. And rare would be if you have 0 to 10 cells per slide. So the entire slide is scanned on oil immersion and you see somewhere between 0 to 10. That would be rare. For a body fluid, which should be completely sterile, if you see zero to five cells per slide using oil immersion, that would be considered a rare quantification. So in the microbiology laboratory, just keep in mind when you get to micro, once you're in your clinical rotations, they do get tired of hearing students say, oh, it stinks. Yes, microbiology is stinky and you do get used to it. So most of the techs working in microbiology don't really smell anything. So just, you know, just know when you get to micro that it is a little bit stinky, but it's not that bad. So quality control. Quality control is extremely important in the clinical laboratory setting. Every single lab has specific daily, weekly, monthly, yearly QC that must be performed. So why do we bother with QC? Well, we are responsible for giving accurate results so that the patients can be properly diagnosed and treated. And in order to ensure that we're giving accurate results, we have to do our quality control to make sure each test and every reagent is working as it should be. So quality control is mandated and there's many different organizations that are responsible for quality control. So there's the Joint Commission for the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, or JCAHO. There's also a new process called performance improvement, and the control procedures are total quality management, or TQM, and continuous quality improvement, or CQI. For QC, all of the rules and procedures should be available in a written form. So there should be a, a manual in any laboratory that you go into that has every single procedure and how it should be performed. So that QC manual in the lab must be reviewed annually and it should be signed and revision should be made as needed. So if any test is modified at all or if a new test is incorporated in a laboratory, it must be added to the manual. All QC activities, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, must be recorded. Each lab has a specific QC recording protocol. All of the recording sheets should list the tolerance limits so that 
if you're putting in the QC results, you'll know if that result is an acceptable result or not. And if it isn't acceptable, there should be a protocol whether it needs to be repeated and, um, you know, usually at that, if, it, if you repeat it and it still is not acceptable, you need to um, tell the supervisor. Any action that's done to correct an unacceptable QC result also must be recorded. So let's say a result wasn't uh, coming in for one of the instruments, so you get a new lot number of reagent and you repeat it and it works. You have to write in the QC a record book that you discarded the previous lot and opened up a new lot and you have to follow the protocols for a new lot. So your QC program should have procedures to control all of the incubator temperatures, the equipment, media, all reagents used for testing, susceptibility testing, and also QC for personnel. For temperatures, daily temperature checks are required on all temperature dependent equipment. So for example, incubators. The temperature is critical for incubators, so those incubator temperatures are checked every single day. Thermometers, special thermometers are usually used that are immersed in glycerol and put inside the incubators and inside any refrigerators so that you can read them very easily because you have to read them every day. Before you actually use these thermometers in your incub incubators or refrigerators, the thermometer has to be checked against a reference thermometer that is specifically purchased from the, or given to the lab from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And that calibrated thermometer, usually the, that thermometer is going to have a certificate of calibration, has to be kept for the life of that thermometer. If someone were to come in and inspect your lab and say, well, how do you know that thermometer is working properly? How do you know that it says four degrees if that refrigerator is in fact four degrees? Well, you have to be able to show that certificate of calibration. And now non-mercury thermometers are what's commonly used. All equipment must be tested for the proper performance at necessary intervals. So for example, checking the uh, CO2 levels in an incubator daily or measuring the RPM of a centrifuge twice per year. So each type of equipment has a specific QC that needs to be done, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, for the centrifuge twice per year. It has to be done and recorded. Also, a preventive maintenance program must be established, and this includes tasks such as oiling instruments, cleaning, filter replacements, as well as recalibration. Recalibra so each instrument is going to have a manual that states when filter should be replaced, when it should be recalibrated. Usually with every new lot number of reagent, you have to recalibrate with the new lot number. All of that has to be done on its requ uh, required schedule. Culture media has to also follow QC. So in a clinical setting, most of the culture media is commercially prepared. So we purchase culture media. But there may be some smaller labs, or if you're working in a research lab or in a health department, some of the culture media may be actually made. So you have to maintain your culture media records for two years. Culture media criteria are established by the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, or CLSI. 
all media before it's used has to be checked for sterility and all media has to be checked using your ATCC or your American Type Culture Collection stock cultures. So your specific QC bacteria that are purchased from ATCC, you have to make sure those organisms look and behave the way they're supposed to on the media that you're using to um, diagnose patient samples. So commercial media is tested first by the manufacturer. So when you purchase a case of media, it comes with a statement of quality control. So as long as you have that case of media, you have to keep that QC statement to prove that, yes, this media was commercially tested. Certain medias that, that we buy all the time that are tested by the manufacturer and don't usually fail very often don't need to then be retested by the laboratory. Although there are media that always has to be retested and these include chocolate agar as well as our selective agars for pathogenic Neisseria and Campylobacter. Media that's prepared in-house and not commercially bought must be QC'd. So any type of media that's prepared has to be tested before it's used for patient diagnosis. So these media must be tested with the stock ATC culture organisms to show that those organisms grow on the media, that they look the way they're supposed to look, and that any biochemical test that you would need to perform on that organism comes out with the appropriate reactions on the media. Before you use any media, whether it's prepared in-house or commercially purchased, you have to check the media for moisture. So media should be free of a layer of water before you use. So plates should be moist there should not be signs of drying they shouldn't be starting to look like little wafers they should be moist but they shouldn't have this layer of water on them so they should be moist but not too moist they definitely need to be sterile so keep in mind plates do have moisture so sometimes you might get a little um, dried water on your agar that's not actually contamination so that would be okay but sometimes there is contamination you'll open up a package of plates and already one of the plates has a fuzzy thing on it so you always want to check for sterility petri dishes shouldn't be cracked or broken because that's going to possibly allow contamination and you always want to look at at the plates. Do they look the way they, they're supposed to? Are they the right color? So any plate that's blood based like our 5% sheep blood agar plates should not be hemolyzed before we inoculate. We use blood agar plates to look for organisms that are capable of hemolyzing. So you don't want to use plates that are already hemolyzed. So you always want to look at the plate if it's the right color, if it's the right uh, moistness, if it's sterile, and if it's not broken. Reagents and stains also have to be QC'd. So you should establish an inventory of all reagents and stains as well as any stocks and solutions. These reagents should be monitored periodically. You have to make sure they're stored appropriately and they're labeled appropriately. So any type of chemical or reagent that might be reactive or could react together should be stored properly. So usually our flammables are stored in a flam flammable container. Biological reagents are stored. Sometimes they need to be stored in a refrigerator. Some need to be stored at room temperature. Anytime you get a new lot of reagent or stained, it 
or stain. It has to be tested with your positive and negative ATCC QC organisms to make sure that they are behaving properly. Reagents, some reagents have to be tested every day with a positive and negative QC organism. So each reagent has different testing intervals. So it's based on the failure rates of that reagent. So you just have to follow the rules for each reagent in the laboratory that you're working. Antimicrobial susceptibility has a lot of QC that are provided by the CLSI guidelines. So you must use those ATCC quality control organisms. Usually the organisms, the susceptibility testing is done every single day until you can demonstrate precision of that test with 20 to 30 consecutive days. So once you get 20 to 30 consecutive days of the same result, then you may be able to just do your QC weekly at, at that point so that it's going to vary. So for your susceptibility QC, the MIC values have to be within one log dilution of the expected value. So once that 20 to 30 day evaluation has been accomplished, then you're testing your QC weekly instead of daily. So all of those results from the 20 or 30 day evaluation have to be kept as long as that antimicrobial agent is used in the laboratory or for at least two years after discontinuing that agent. Personnel is also QC'd. So again, we have our procedure manuals that should be written and accessible to every person in the laboratory. Those manuals should be maintained. And for any personnel, if you have a test that just doesn't seem to make sense or you're seeing some isolate that you just normally don't see or haven't seen before, that always should be brought to the attention of the supervisor. So you never want to make any decisions on something that you're not comfortable with. So proficiency testing is done for personnel. So specifically designed samples are given to techs as unknowns. These samples can be prepared internally so when you're going through your clinical rotations you will be tested for your proficiency. The techs in the laboratory may prepare some samples and say tell, tell us what's in there. Tell us how you would analyze this specimen and make sure that you would do things appropriately. Sometimes these proficiency samples can also be uh, commercially per uh, purchased. So you can purchase your QC samples and any test that a laboratory performs on a patient is subjected to proficiency testing twice per year. So many laboratories get QC proficiency samples sent to them several times per year from CAP, at least twice per year. And all the techs that perform that test have to take that sample and report out exactly what they would get, just the way they would always um, analyze that sample. So positive and negative controls also always have to be used to standardize your test interpretation. So 
all work in a clinical laboratory is reviewed. So one person will do a test. So let's say one day you're on the urine bench and you're going to work up all the urines. There's going to be someone else that is going to review all of the results. So that it's less likely that a mistake will be made when you have several people doing different steps of the testing procedure. So CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act of 1988, mandated that the competency of each employee must be determined and verified upon employment and then re-verification should be done annually. So proof of competency must be maintained in that employee's personnel file. So many agencies involved in the accreditation and inspection have different requirements. You also have to document your continuing education and that's usually done through your board of registry examination. You have to get a certain number of continuing education credits per year. You have to document those. You have to submit those in order to maintain your license. Okay, stock cultures, we have already talked about the QC stock cultures. And you always have to keep in mind that bacteria mutate. So if you repeatedly sub your bacteria over and over again, they can mutate and then not behave the way they should. So stock cultures, you have to grow up your QC organisms in a large volume, you then want to divide those into small freezer vials and you want to freeze those down, usually store them at minus 80 so that they would be viable for one year. So then a new frozen vial can be removed each week so that you're not continuously subculturing from that same vial. So you're taking that original stock from the freezer and using it for that week and then taking it again another vial the following week. An organism should be subcultured twice after thawing because when an organism is sitting in the freezer, it isn't going to be as hardy right when you sub it out. So it's been stuck in a freezer, it's been sitting in a freezing agent such as glycerol or DMSO. So it may not be as hardy as it should be. So whenever you take your frozen stock out, you want to sub it, take an organism from that plate and sub it again. That's the organism you want to do your testing on because now it's been subbed twice, it's growing, it's nice and hardy, healthy, and it should behave as it normally would. So agencies such as the JCAHO and the College of American Pathologists or CAP have to provide QC as well as accreditation checklists. So CLIA mandates performance improvement policies and every single lab has to have a plan for performance improvement. So every lab has a vision statement, a mission statement, they have indicators of performance improvement, so what's been done to per improve performance, they have to establish performance monitors and also have benchmarks. So I always end the first lecture with the respect bacteria because they're the only culture that some people will ever have. So hopefully we will have a very successful summer three week applied microbiology course. Remember this is a review of all of the organisms we already discussed last semester. So you already know all of the reactions and everything you need to know about these organisms. So this semester should be nice and fun and it's, you, you already know everything. You're just going to now look at it from a specimen perspective as, instead of an organism group perspective.
So try to have a good time and learn as much as possible because this summer is what you will be doing when you get into the clinical setting. So this is how things are done in a clinical microbiology laboratory. Good luck.